Good afternoon, ladies. I'm Michelle Easton, president of the Claire Booth Luce Policy Institute, and I want to welcome you all to our Conservative Women's Network today. Special thanks to our partner, the Heritage Foundation, Bridget Wagner, for co-hosting this event with us every month. We've invited two policy experts to talk with us today about a critical foreign policy issue facing our nation, the crisis in Ukraine. This morning I read that the Prime Minister of Ukraine has said, Russia wants to start a third world war, and he called again for more international help. Russian troops have taken the Crimea, that's the Ukrainian province, I think you all know, with a majority eth Russian ethnic and Russian speaking politician. It's a peninsula down at the south of the Ukrainian mainland, just west of Russian territory. And large numbers of Russian troops are doing exercises less than a mile from the Ukrainian border. Russian Prime Minister Putin is pounding his chest with and without his shirt. <laughs> and absurdly claims that the Ukraine's attempts at defending their country are offense against Russia. And America's President Obama, who likes to lead from behind, has a clear policy on uh, Ukraine of, what? What is, what is that policy? Mm -hmm. You know, you just cringe um, in anticipation of the freedom-loving people in Ukraine who fought with us in Iraq and Afghanistan um, when we have such an amazingly weak United States president. This is not a small crisis for the United States or the rest of the free world, and it's much more dangerous than much of the current reporting and discussion on it acknowledges. So we've brought two extraordinarily well-informed conservative leaders to speak about this today. Uh, both of these ladies are the consummate professionals. They both have families. Diana has six children. Heli has two children and husbands, and in addition to that, they have had incredible careers. So I'm going to tell you about their careers. Heli Dale is the Senior Fellow in Public Diplomacy Studies here at the Heritage Foundation. She focuses on America's strategic outreach to the people of foreign countries, as well as traditional diplomacy, both critical elements in American global leadership. Her career began in journalism, where she worked for both domestic and foreign, policy, uh, foreign uh, publications in 1991, she joined the Washington Times, where she was responsible for the newspaper's editorial positions in foreign affairs and national security policy. She later became the newspaper's editorial page editor, where she oversaw the paper's policy on presidential, congressional, and local politics, as well as foreign affairs. Heli has traveled widely in Central and Eastern Europe, the former Soviet Union, the Middle East, and Asia, and she continues to write about foreign policy issues her work has appeared in so many publications, the Wall Street Journal, National Review, and many more, and you've seen her so many times on uh, television programs. She earned a diploma of English studies in Oxford, England, graduated with a master's degree in English and American studies from the University of Copenhagen in Denmark, and pursued graduate work in American studies at Tufts University in Boston. Also with us today is Diana Fershcott Roth, a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and the director of Economics 21, an organization dedicated to economic research and innovative public policy. Diana formerly served as chief of staff of President George W. Bush's Council on Economic Advisors and later as chief economist of the U.S. Department of Labor. Under President George H.W. Bush, she was executive director, deputy executive director of the Domestic Policy Council and Associate Director of the Office of Policy Planning in the White House. She was also an economist on the staff of President Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors. She's the author of two books, Regulating five, to Disaster. Five books. Five books. Those okay. are just the two more recent. And I'm, I'm only going to mention two. <laughs> yeah, those are just the two more recent. <laughs> Regulating to Disaster, How Green Jobs Policies Are Damaging America's Economy, and one that I love, it's called Woman's Figures, an Illustrated Guide to the Economic Progress of Women in America. She's also the editor of the book Overcoming Barriers to Entrepreneurship. She's had articles in all the major papers, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and appeared many, many times also on television and radio programs. She received her BA in Economics from Swarthmore College and her Master of Philosophy in Economics from Oxford University. Please join me in thanking them for coming, and we'll start with Heli. Thank you. Thanks, thank 
you, Michelle, for inviting me again, and, and Bridget. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be back speaking uh, before this group um, where I have been, it seems like a while ago, and I'm just delighted to be back. And thank you for taking up this incredibly important subject, which I'm afraid is not getting uh, the attention it deserves. I mean, if you think about it, probably we hear more about the um, disappearance of the Malaysian airliner than we hear about uh, yeah. the potential Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine uh, in, the, in the US media. So really, it is, uh, it is very timely. Uh, the uh, uh, subject of, of, uh, of today's um, meeting here, uh, how to evaluate the reset with Russia and should we have another reset of the reset, uh, I think is incredibly timely. Um, I think the world as we know it today could use some improvements and, and uh, particularly in this sphere. The um, Russian rhetoric and military moves against the border of eastern Ukraine uh, are becoming more and more menacing. And it's kind of clear that Vladimir Putin has taken uh, the concept of reset into his own hands. Um, I have noticed that there was, seems to be a confluence of Russia taking chunks of its uh, neighbors uh, that coincide with the Olympic Games. So maybe uh, we should postpone the next uh, Summer Olympics. Uh, Georgia was a victim in the uh, summer Olympics uh, some years ago, the winter, uh, the winter Olympics here in Sochi, we saw uh, Crimea being gobbled up by uh, Russia. So um, clearly when they think that our uh, attention is elsewhere, they have decided to make their moves. Now, <clears throat> I think it's important to remember that the concept of a reset policy with Russia uh, was a bit of a mistake or a, a bit of um, a, a misconception to start with. In 2009, then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton uh, handed to the Russian Foreign Minister this famous red button, which was supposed to say reset. Well, it didn't actually say that because it didn't translate the American word correctly. Uh, it, it said something like overcharge. And there was a, there was a so they put the relationship on overcharge. It was a, a, a complete misconception from the beginning, and it was kind of unfortunate in a public setting to look so idiotic. Uh, but uh, the Obama administration based its policy with Russia, uh, as so many other parts of its foreign policy, on the mistaken assumption that American and Russian strategic interests were identical. Um, and that all that stood in the way of great relations with Russia and with the Russian president were the bad, bad vibes left over from the presidency of George W. Bush. Well, uh, following this line of reasoning, the Obama administration proceeded to make a number of policy moves which were actually not in the U.S. interest. They canceled <clears throat> the centerpiece, one of the centerpieces of the Bush foreign policy, a land-based missile defense in Europe because of Russian objections. Uh, President Obama embraced a new START treaty which cut U.S. defense but left room for aggressive Ru Russian missile uh, uh, nuclear modernization. And uh, not so long ago, uh, he handed President uh, Obama, that is, handed U.S. policy on Syria and its chemical weapons over to the Russians as well. Um, in every step, we have found that the U.S. has made itself an accomplice or a bystander in relations with Russia, uh, definitely not a leader in the relationship. Now, uh, the struggle over the future of Ukraine <clears throat> has been a, definitely a wake-up call in Washington, but uh, what exactly our policy is is still rather unclear. But it has shown us at least clearly how divergent U.S. and Russian interests are. Uh, but it has made very clear that the Obama administration has very little concept of how to deal with actual brute force and undeniable geopolitical facts that do not change, that are unchangeable in many ways, and do not lend themselves to diplomatic maneuverings. It is very clear uh, that it is an extremely uncomfortable position. Right now, it appears that um, Secretary of State Kerry, 
and Vice President Biden are the leaders in thinking on uh, U.S.-Ukrainian relations and the future of our relationships. Uh, meanwhile, President Obama uh, has been traveling in Japan uh, and are being seen all over YouTube uh, playing soccer with a robot. Uh, can you imagine this uh, constellation of affairs taking place under George W. Bush or maybe even Bill Clinton, or certainly not Ronald Reagan. Uh, we are at a crisis in world affairs, with Russia having seized the initiative to grab uh, a piece of its neighbor, Ukraine, uh, basically rewriting the international order that has been established since 1945. And the American president is almost pretending that this is not happening. It, it, it is a really... Um, very un uh, unfortunate uh, signal that we're sending. Uh, John Kerry has spoken somewhat pathetically the, uh, of the Russian behavior being an intrusion of the 19th century and 19th century geopolitical strategy into a 21st century world. Well, even in the world of the internet, territory is really what matters, and that is what the Russians are acting on. Things like geography and history have not changed that much in the world of the internet and Twitter, nor have concepts like aggression and territorial ambition. Given the Western response, President Putin may well feel tempted to give his neo-imperialist agenda another push. The land grab of the Crimea in February um, was probably occasioned by the Western-oriented aspirations of the Ukrainian people. Uh, but we can, I think, assume that other parts of the former Soviet Union that have similar Western aspirations um, could be in for similar treatment. Eastern Ukraine is currently under pressure from the thousands, tens of thousands of Russian troops amassed just across the border. And we're seeing a replay of the um, insurgency by native Russians and by uh, probably Russian activists uh, in, the, in the cities of eastern Ukraine where they have grabbed government buildings and where they have been, um, where there have been violent confrontations with the Ukrainian police and military. Uh, in the Baltics, which we should be watching this weekend, there are military maneuvers and NATO military exercises, the Baltic states, of course, are a part of NATO. And um, if we do have to look at where red lines ought to be drawn by uh, the United States, that is probably a red line that we would have to say cannot be crossed. Uh, an invasion of a NATO member or military attack on one of the NATO members will call into effect Article 5, which calls for mutual support and military assistance to those who come under attack. NATO ought to be um, uh, the line that uh, we, we definitely should say cannot be crossed. But if, unfortunately, um, the Obama administration has had a way of drawing red lines uh, in Ukraine, in Syria, and elsewhere that people then continue to cross with impunity. So uh, watching um, the Baltics, watching Ukraine, uh, we are really in some very dangerous territory here in relations between the Russia and the United States. Now, uh, at the Heritage Foundation, we spend a lot of time thinking about uh, what we think our policy options should be to take us out of the box where we are now. And the Heritage prescription for a real reset with Russia uh, has a number of elements to it. Uh, the first uh, would be to show a, a complete U.S. Um, commitment to NATO uh, to assure NATO members in Central and Eastern Europe that their defense is guaranteed and that spillover from any possible conflict uh, within the former Soviet Union can be contained. It could mean deploying additional American resources to the region and uh, uh, doing so primarily on a bilateral basis because, unfortunately, um, the European Union is a very difficult um, political 
animal to deal with, uh, going through the EU is always pretty hard, as we're finding in negotiations over sanctions. So um, a military assertiveness within members of NATO uh, showing American commitment would be very important. Um, secondly, we should uh, improve and deepen relations with Eastern Europe beyond defense. As Michelle noticed, these are countries that really stood with the United States in the uh, Iraq war, in Afghanistan. I mean, they showed themselves that they want to be true allies. Uh, and then also you included Ukraine. So I think we ought to show them that we are not fickle, or, uh, fickle weather friends, uh, or fair weather friends, I should say. Uh, that we are with them just as they were with us. Uh, we also need um, to increase their opportunities to, to diversify their um, energy imports. Right now, very unfortunately, a lot of countries in Europe have tied themselves to Russian exports of liquid natural gas, um, facilitated by all the you know, Russian pipelines. And geography is in the Russian favor here. But it has produced in a very um, troublesome dependency, which makes people reluctant to confront Russia when Russia decides that it wants to make a move against other countries. Um, we need to immediately to withdraw from the New START Treaty. Uh, that has been a bad deal from the beginning. Uh, it was one of the first things proposed by President Obama when he took office in 2009. Uh, he was, uh, he had, there was a big nuclear summit, and he declared that Russia and the United States were going to show the world that if you give up your nuclear weapons, then everyone else would want to do the same. Well, somehow that reasoning just didn't sit, you know, didn't penetrate to people who have nuclear aspirations, uh, like Iran and North Korea. They said, well, that's nothing to do with us. We're just going to do what we're, it's in our interest. And the Russians got a pretty good deal because um, they had an opportunity to modernize their nuclear arsenal. Meanwhile, we keep cutting ours because we just don't think that's important anymore. So um, withdrawal from that treaty um, and implementing an effective global missile defense um, some of the things that uh, we consider extremely important. Sanctions on Russia, making sanctions spite, so that Russia can feel that there is a genuine opposition in the world to, to, what, um, to, the, to their uh, policy now of uh, treating ethnic Russians as though they are a reason to invade their neighbors. There are ethnic Russians all over the former Soviet empire, and treating ethnicity as more important than citizenship, well, eventually, you know, you, you, you can create an awful lot of havoc by going that way. So sanctions that bite, sanctions directed both against the Russian energy sector and against individuals who have behind, been behind the Russian policy to invade Ukraine are uh, um, um, also key. And yes, work with our European partners to help them do the same but do it so on a bilateral basis. And finally, I want to say a word about uh, something that I work on, uh, public diplomacy, and the um, importance of fashioning the US message. If we have sanctions that bite on Russia, we should be able to inform the Russian people that it's not because we don't wish them well. In fact, we do. But we do not wish their government will in its current efforts to dominate um, its neighbors and to stabilize them and even occupy them. Uh, messaging from the US government in the past traditionally was uh, channeled through our broadcasting services, Voice of America, Radio for Europe, and Radio Liberty in this part of the world. But since the fall of the, or the end of the Cold War, we have de-emphasized that messaging. It was considered kind of old Cold War kind of rhetoric. We don't want that anymore. Um, people will understand that we're a great country, and that's really all they need to know. Well, they do need to hear from us why we do what we're doing, what is going on in their own countries. And one of the things that Vladimir Putin, who is a former intelligence officer um, in the KGB and the GRU, is absolutely expert at, is messaging. He has pretty much managed to shut down communication with or uh, communication efforts, broadcasting from other countries, from other broadcasting services, from the United States, 
um, other international broadcasters are not being received in uh, Russia, in Crimea. I mean, they're operating in information vacuum, relying exclusively on Russian news, Russian broadcasting, Russian propaganda. Um, he even instituted, um, uh, that was this year, I think, or maybe it was December, a new information ministry. So their focus on their propaganda, their information warfare, is, is intense. <coughs> While we have been de-escalating ours, we need to get that function, that functionality back. And, uh, uh, and we are waiting uh, somewhat with bated breath for a, a bill that's coming up in Congress, maybe as early as today, to reform U.S. international broadcasting and make it more effective. I mean, it's only one way, but um, it, it is an important way to, to reach other countries about what the United States is doing and why it's doing it. Uh, the bottom line, I think, is that we need to be proactive. We need not just to sit back and wait and be reactive and say, every time the Russian government decides to do something, uh, we are not back on our heels because we didn't think this was going to happen. Or somehow we thought, well, 40,000 Russian troops on the border of Ukraine, I wonder what they're going to do with those. What do you think? I mean, really. <laughs> Or as my daughter would say, seriously. Uh, <laughs> the, you know, this doesn't seem to be brain surgery, but, uh, but you know, we need to be a little assertive about, first of all, what we stand for, what is in your interest, and what is in the interest of the people who are our allies in those regions. So I will Thank you, Helly. Well, a, good, a good beginning to this discussion. I especially liked the idea that we start the messaging to the world again and to the Russian people because things are not so different there as they were. Uh, let's get some of Ronald Reagan's people back yeah. to work on that, maybe. Thank you. Thank you. Diana. Well, thank you very much, Michelle, for inviting me. Thank you, thank you for setting up the event. Thank all of you for coming. When I was at Swarthmore College, there was no conservative women's network. When I was at Oxford, there was no conservative women's network either. In fact, when I got to Oxford to do my graduate studies, I was assigned the professor of Marxist economics. <laughs> Uh, which is maybe one reason I completed my MPhil, but not my DPhil. We had substantial disagreements. So uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, we're also very honored to have with us the first secretary of the Russian Federation, uh, Secretary Pelachak, who's, uh, I believe, sitting over here. Uh, welcome. Uh, and uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have, as well as everybody else. So Heli talked about uh, fair weather friends. and. To be quite honest, our administration uh, just is a fair weather friend. So I don't believe that we are going to be of very much help to Ukraine by thinking of what is in their interests. But what I would like to propose is to do something and help Ukraine and other countries uh, from the Russian aggressors by looking at what is in our own interests. And it's in our own interests to export more natural gas. Uh, Russia supplies about 30% of Europe's natural gas, about uh, half of Ukraine's natural gas. The price of natural gas is $4.5 per million BTUs here. It's about $11 per million BTUs in Europe. It is profitable for us to export natural gas, and that'll make the price of natural gas go down uh, in uh, Russia, and it will also take away some of Russia's markets. Now, we cannot expect President Obama uh, to do something that he thinks is against his interests just because it is in the interests of countries around the world who are friends. So far, his track record has not shown that he is going to do that. But one could expect, perhaps, that he would uh, uh, support changing the laws and allowing more exports. Not even changing the laws, but do you know that we have two dozen exports waiting at the Energy Department? to export natural gas. That's 29 billion cubic feet per day that could be exported if only the Energy Department would move a little bit faster. And some of these applications have been waiting since 2011 and 2012. It doesn't take brain surgery to say, OK, we can just move these applications forward. Right now, companies can only export natural gas abroad if it's a country to which we have a free trade agreement. Again, it's not very difficult for Congress to change those laws. What about allowing liquid natural gas to be exported to all World Trade Organization members, irrespective of what, whether they have 
uh, free trade agreements with the United States or not, or all OECD countries, or just take off the lid on any exports, just say, if countries want to buy our LNG, they can buy our LNG. They can buy our liquid natural gas. That would be very simple. It would be in our interests because oil and gas is the driver of America's economy right now. If it weren't for the oil and gas sector, as my colleague Mark Mills has laid out in a paper recently published on the Manhattan Institute website, our economy would still be in a recession. The oil and gas sector is creating millions of jobs, not just directly, but also indirectly. Plus, what's amazing is how much natural gas uh, we are wasting. If you fly over North Dakota, you can see that we are flaring natural gas. Uh, and uh, I have the numbers here. Uh, we, are, we, are we are flaring about... Um, we, are, we are flaring about 300 million cubic feet per day. That means what we're, we're doing is wasting it because natural gas is a byproduct of the oil drilling process and we can't use it. So what do we do? It's like turning on a burner, a gas burner on your stove and just burning it. We're just burning it all up. Now, perhaps not all of this can be marketed, but a substantial portion of it can be marketed. We also need to be approving more permits for pipelines to actually get the natural gas out of North Dakota. Now, it's actually, uh, there are people who say, well, we can't export more natural gas. And let me just go through some of the reasons. So, for example, uh, we have Senator Markey, who says we cannot export natural gas because the price will rise. But we've seen, and you, this graph is on our e economics21.org website, that since 2008, uh, as exports have risen, the price has gone down. So in the past, we have seen that this isn't true. Drilling efficiency has substantially increased over the past seven years. Uh, and natural gas production, according to uh, the Department of Energy, is supposed to increase 56% through 2040. We have plenty of natural gas, and if we knew, if companies knew they could export it, they would make investments in more facilities, investments in pipelines, which could actually serve to reduce the price rather than increase it. Another myth is that actions today won't increase exports until it's too late. In fact, we've been hearing this for years. So, so far, people have been saying, well, we can't, if we did it now, it wouldn't be available for another five years, so it wouldn't affect the price. But that ignores the roles of expectations in pricing. Have you noticed that, for example, if there's a freeze in Florida for the citrus, the price rises almost immediately? If there is an announcement about hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico, the price of gasoline rises with supplies being untouched. That's because futures markets are affected by these announcements, and prices in the future affect prices in the present. And I have some quotes uh, here put together uh, very, um, for, by the House Energy and Commerce Committee uh, in a forum on Capitol Hill last fall. So uh, Lithuanian Ambassador Pavilionis said, quote, an ability to import natural gas from the US even very small amounts by US standards, would make a huge impact on the Lithuanian gas market and allow the nation to develop a reliable alternative to Russian gas. And according to Jaroslav Zajicek, the Czech Republic's deputy chief of mission, and I quote, we have already seen examples where the Russian negotiating position during contract renewal talks was weakened thanks to decreasing prices on the markets in Western Europe. So, that, uh, so uh, our allies abroad know that actions here would help them. Now, the environmentalists uh, have a different uh, approach to these uh, Senator Markey, who thinks that uh, increasing exports will raise prices. They are concerned that increasing exports will mean that we use more natural gas. More natural gas is used. Therefore, we will have more emissions, and there will be more pollution. And this is harmful for global warming. Oops, climate change. That's what we're supposed to call it now, climate change. It would be harmful for climate change. But really, natural gas is a very clean form of energy. If we export more, it might very well be worthwhile uh, for Europe to 
uh, end the use of some of its coal-fired power plants or put in place cleaner technologies. So actually increased production of natural gas as it makes it less expensive could replace wood and it could replace coal and it could replace a whole variety of energy generating technologies uh, that are more expensive and are dirtier. So it actually could serve to reduce emissions uh, rather than increase emissions. There's another myth which Heli has dealt with, uh, that America is incapable of using economic power to promote our strategic natural interests. And in the defense area, it does seem as though that is so. But that doesn't mean that we can't promote our natural and our national, our national economic interest by making increased use of our oil and gas industry. Uh, this would help our friends abroad. It would help people here who want more jobs. It would help revive our economy. It's a win-win-win for all. And this is what we need to be pressuring the administration to do, to hit Putin where it hurts, in his pocketbook, and help us at the same time. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, ladies. I think we have two microphones here to uh, take questions. This uh, lady I got to talk with her is an intern at Heritage from Azusa Pacific. And over here, an intern at Heritage from the Hillsdale College. Great. If you would uh, raise your hand and we'll call on you. Here we go. If you give your name and affiliation, please. Hi, I'm Catherine Rodriguez. I'm with the Claire Booth Luce Institute. Thank you so much for being here today to talk about this really important topic. Um, I wanted to go back to what you said about sanctions specifically. What specific sanctions would be the most hard hitting? We talked about helping with the natural gas production, which sounds like a really good idea, but what would hurt the most besides that? Well, I think economic sanctions, I mean, specifically, I think if you're looking at the banking sector, that is um, absolutely <clears throat> access to Western banks and financial markets is one area that, that you know, Russia depends on, whether it's the um, above the board economy or the black economy. Uh, that, that is, I think, probably one of the key uh, elements in a, in a sanctions regime. I mean, beyond that, you know, you can hit people individually by freezing their assets. Uh, but uh, um, I, I think those are, you know, banking and energy would be the two sectors that you primarily look at. We've seen, however, that President Obama has just withdrawn the sanctions from Iran uh, and has unfrozen uh, billions of dollars in Iranian assets, even though we know that Iran uh, is uh, trying, is funding terrorism all around the world. So I wouldn't really hold my breath and wait for President Obama to impose those sanctions. And it, it's actually a shame because the U.S. sanctions, I mean, the international sanctions on Iran did have a real impact. And what was the pretense for lifting them? <clears throat> well, it was, it was tied to um, Iran's uh, nuclear, nu uh, nuclear program. Don't you know that Iran has given up its nuclear weapons program? <laughs> yeah, did you hear that? I didn't know. <laughs> and in exchange for that, we lifted the sanctions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, can I ask? Said it just <laughs> um, Hella, can you just, you yeah. mentioned just very briefly in passing that there was a bill that might be moving as soon as today in right. the Congress that would be reforming our broadcasting. Can you go into that a little bit more? What, what would the bill do and who's sponsoring this and is it in the Senate or is it in the House for those people who are interested in this issue? What should they be looking for? Right, um, well it, it, it has been the, an, an initiative coming out of the House Foreign Affairs Committee um, under Secret um, uh, Chairman uh, Royce. His staff really kind of decided to tackle the issue of international broadcasting. One of the dysfunctional elements of U.S. policy for a long time, and it it uh, it, it seeks to, as far as I understand it, and, and we do have a, a, a brand new uh, public heritage publication up on our website um, about this uh, topic. Uh, it, it would kind of take the Voice of America, um, ma make sure that Voice of America itself as an institution, a public diplomacy institution, really represents U.S. policy and is functional in all the parts of the world that we need to reach. So it really supports that. Um, it would give it a real uh, hands-on uh, chief executive officer um, and, a, and a board that would be an advisory board uh, and, and really uh, support that function. Then, on the other hand, it would separate out the 
so-called liberty radios. And these are radios, um, Radio Liberty, Radio for Europe, Radio for Asia, uh, not, not Cuba Broadcasting because they're still a bit separate, but uh, that broadcast news about what goes on in Iran, um, domestic news to countries that do not otherwise have access to their own media. And they would have their own uh, organization in a sort of dotted line relationship with Voice of America, but they would be separate and they would have their own support, their own board, their own strong executive. Um, right now, it's all a bit of a model, model kind of thrown together under a broadcasting board of governors, which has been doing a bad job of strategizing. So we get two strong institutions that could formulate strategy, work together where needed to, but, but also be, be free to pursue their own interests. That's kind of, I think, where they're going. Uh, and it will really create a bit of a debate and, uh, about you know, these incredibly important, important issues. Great. So uh, look, look for it. Uh, and there are some similar legislation in the Senate. And then on the, on the energy, I know the House Republicans um, took up, after you wrote about this, Diane, I think you were one of the first to write mm -hmm. about expanding the energy exports yeah. and the natural gas exports. Republicans seemed to step in and begin to talk like they were going to introduce something. Have yeah. you seen any movement in the Congress? Uh, well, they're on Easter break right now. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about it, Still? and I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure that there are some who are in favor of it, but uh, we haven't seen anything concrete yet. And I should say, in February, the House Energy and Commerce Committee did have a report on expanding exports of natural gas before uh, Russia moved into the Ukraine. Uh, so um, so they, they were already thinking about it in February prior to this. And, but I think that if there's enough public opinion you know, we have the best government money can buy. Uh, if there's enough public opinion, if enough people call up and say we should do this, then I think they might be shamed into doing it. And after all, they have many constituents who would benefit from jobs in the oil and natural gas industry and in associated industries with advanced manufacturing that make things like uh, pipes and drilling bits and also information supply chain equipment. Good point. So many of you in the audience, um, young ladies, weren't even born when our greatest modern president fought the battle of, uh, of the century and, uh, and won, the, won the Cold War. So the specter of tanks rolling into you know, freedom-loving countries is not something that maybe strikes fear in you like it does for some of us oldsters who saw it, except the extent that you saw it in your history books. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you need to go back and read about it. Um, some of us remember it quite well. Um, I wanted to ask if you all had a magic wand, Diane and Heli. I know, we'd get the gas, we'd get the <laughs> gas to the next targets. But what would you do? What would you do about Ukraine and the future Soviet and Russian incursions into uh, countries that want freedom and not domination? What would you do? Well, isn't that a good question? Um, we remember back to the Cold War, which is which is a, a educational to do. I mean, we, we were struggling with that issue during the Cold War, mm -hmm. the Soviet invasion of Hungary in 1956, Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968, um, um, uh, Berlin, um, 1962. I mean, we have been through these crises, and we didn't always uh, handle them as well as we should have because countries were left under... Soviet domination back then. I mean, Reagan's big insight, which you just reminded me of, was um, at one, when he took office, he sat down with all his advisors and he said, well, what can we do about the Soviets? Um, do we have uh, more military? Well, they say, well, they do have more troops than we do. Well, do we have more this and that? Well, they have more, they have more guns, they have more all sorts of things. And the Reagan said, well, what do we have more of? And they said, well, we have more money. Mm -hmm. And we still have more money. I mean, the financial aspect, the financial domination of the United States on the world stage is something that we forget about when, when we, you know, oh, we're all moaning and groaning here, particularly in, under this president, I must say, about how awful things are. Well, this is still the world's largest economy. Um, and, and I think we, you know, our economic power, we should use to our advantage. And we should make people understand that there is a price to be paid for invading your neighbors. We can't just pretend this didn't happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, this is before my time, but you know, 1938, the Germans invaded um, Czechoslovakia and, and when nobody thought that was very important at the time. Well, haha. -ha. Uh, so 
I, I would say, you know, you know, raise the level of the discourse, raise the level of the economic consequences for um, invading your neighbors. Show real support for your. I mean, we are sending them non-military, mili non non-military support, mm -hmm. like meals and socks, and you know. I mean, we're we're not supporting them in a in a true fashion, which we have done in the past. We have made our um, military exports available to those who need to defend themselves. I mean, we we can step step this up several levels, mm -hmm. and at least make the point that we do not consider this to be acceptable behavior. Russia was thrown out of the G8, which is now the G7 again, which it should have been all along. But you know, there are not any number of other international arenas that we could make. Uh, that are available for making diplomatic points like that. So, mm -hmm. I, I do not, and I, I do not advocate a military confrontation with Russia by any means. But I do advocate using all the other means we have, for the moment, to make the points that we need to make, so that perhaps we can avoid a confrontation in the future. Thank you. Well, I think that the object shouldn't be to avoid a confrontation in the future. The, the president should take a strong line. He should say this isn't something. That he would, uh, that he's going to stand for. It's contrary to the Budapest Amendment, uh, where Europe and the United States said that they would uh, protect Ukrainian sovereignty, uh, signed in 1994, reiterated by uh, by Obama in 2009. Uh, if I could wave a magic wand, I would have him send in real supplies, uh, send in arms, send in food, ask mm -hmm. them what they needed, send it over in planes, give it to them right away. I mean, uh, they don't have much of an army over there. They don't have much money. They're asking people to mm -hmm. step forward and fork over the money themselves to defend themselves. So I would help them uh, that way. Instead, we are, uh, I would also move in warships uh, and uh, uh, other kinds of things that Heli knows much more about than uh, I would, that, uh, than I do. Uh, plus, I would say that I am uh, lifting any constraints on exports of LNG, that our companies can export anything that they like. I am speeding up permits of uh, pipelines to improve the United States infrastructure to make it easier to get the supplies that we have right now in the middle of the country, uh, in other words, North Dakota, Ohio, Indiana, make it easier to get those to the coast where they could be shipped out. I would make that announcement too. Uh, and I would go ahead and do it. I would take a very tough line, but unfortunately, I, or fortunately, actually, I'm not president <laughs> of the United States. <laughs> oh, no, unfortunately. That's great. Any other, uh, oh, yes. Well, you asked the question, Michelle, that I had, was going to ask, so, and then you carried on with um, an explanation. How, but this is my, um, I can't figure out, when you say ethnic, ethnic uh, Russians, who exactly are you talking about, and how how are these divided up within the country? That these the these are for Ukrainian government, and the others are for uh, the Russians. Okay, well, thank you for asking that question. It's something that we've been talking about here a lot more than we've had occasion to in the recent past. So the question of ethnicity is is actually kind of an interesting thing because as it's defined. Um, you know, we're talking about the ethnic, my, uh, ethnic uh, major Russian majority in the Crimea, for instance, uh, who went out and voted in favor of um, joining Russia, which they then did. Well, ethnic in that context actually simply, in some ways, means Russian speaking, which is not necessarily as your, the same as your, you know, genetic ethnic heritage. It's a very um, unclear concept, really. And when you think about Russia, which is the largest country in the world, it's composed of a lot of different, actually, ethnic groups. Um, some Just are like Asians. the United States. Right. Yes. Uh, so it's, it's, as though, it's as though Mexico would say that, well, we're, you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're going to have a vote in Texas and California to see if Hispanics want to join Mexico. And if so, if they vote yes, then we're going to move in. I mean, it's a bit like that. Yeah, and when you, exactly, and when you look at the map of Europe, um, of which Russia, some of Russia at least belongs, <clears throat> it is a complete patchwork of different kinds of people, of different um, ethnicities, but th that doesn't mean that we're moving the borders around all the time. You know, there are Swedes, ethnic Swedes living in Finland. There are ethnic um, Italians living in Switzerland. 
I mean, these are citizens of those countries. It just so happens that their, you know, their heritage goes back, way back to another culture. Um, you've got the Irish and the English and the Scots. I mean, there are lots and lots of different people around Europe who are where they are for different historical reasons. But that doesn't mean that they are not citizens of the countries where they live. So the idea that, I mean, borders, and this has been the agreement for many, many decades, that borders should remain where they are. And people are citizens of the countries where they live, uh, not depending on where their parents came from mm -hmm. or what language they speak. Um, if, if that was the standard we went by, then you know Switzerland couldn't exist, Belgium couldn't exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why did they want? Why did they want to? be a part of the Ukraine if that isn't, if they don't want to have the sovereignty of, of, of the Ukraine? Well, I think what, it's, what happened was that um, when Ukraine was still part of the Soviet Union, for uh, reasons that are somewhat unclear to me, in 1956, the Crimean Peninsula, um, which was Russian, and where it's also the home of the Russian uh, fleet, um, the Russian warm water fleet. So it's very strategically very important. It, it, it sticks out in the middle of the Black Sea. Um, for some administrative reason, it was handed over to Ukraine, who was then a republic of the Soviet Union. So, I mean, in those days, I think borders were not quite as important as they are now, clearly not, because it was all the Soviet Union. Now, um, but I think that you can't excuse one country moving right. to another by saying there are many of its citizens there. That's Especially exactly contravening the point. international law and flooding a country with soldiers without insignia on them. Right. And but, but the, well, another thing the Russians like to do is they, they'll suddenly start issuing passports, Russian passports, to ethnic Russians who live in other republics. And when you've got enough of those, they'll then say, well, oh no, now, now this is Russia. Mm. Um, so. Mm. They've done that in the Baltics, they've done it in Crimea. So, you know, you don't kind of just do that. Mm -hmm. it, and and the, the fact is that it is clearly part of a larger strategy, which is why it's also so concerning. And, and it follows really bad relations with Ukraine for a number of years. I mean, losing Ukraine was a big deal for Russia when the Soviet Union broke apart. Well, and the spark was that Ukraine wanted to join uh, Europe as part of the NATO trading agreement and uh, that and, uh, and the EU, and that was what was really the spark that caused the current problem. Mm. Russia was very unhappy uh, about Ukraine joining the EU. Mm -hmm. One more. In here and then here. Thank you, my name is Alexa. I'm here um, as an intern with the Heritage Foundation. And uh, my question is for you, Diana. If we were to free up the trade, um, the trade restrictions on natural gas exports, um, by necessity, would we see Congress um, want to increase our infrastructure in terms of um, granting permits to industries, um, oil and gas industry? So uh, if Congress approved the permits that are now waiting uh, for, uh, for export, if Congress allowed more exports, then the private sector would build the infrastructure. That would not be a cost to the U.S. Congress. All Congress would have to do is say, if you want to sell to these other countries, you can sell to these other countries. Uh, what would be useful would be uh, for some expedited uh, permitting allowed for the pipelines, but there isn't any fiscal cost for it. Right now, as we know, Keystone XL, that's the main example of a pipeline that's been held up uh, from Canada to the United States. Uh, even though pipelines are the most efficient way of transporting oil, because the container stays still and the product moves in it, any other way of transporting oil and gas has uh, barges, rail, and road, and they have the containers, and the containers themselves move. They can bang into other containers. Pipelines are buried under six feet or so of earth. Uh, and they don't move at all. Uh, so uh, permits can be held up to build the pipelines. And I'm not sure how much control the federal government has over some of these, because some of these go through state lines. But definitely by approving the exports, which is the big holdup, private companies can take care 
of building the infrastructure, and that's at no additional cost to the federal government. Thank you. I think there's one here. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Debbie Rivera, and um, this is for, well, maybe for both of you, but um, Hallie, you mentioned that <coughs> the United States has a lot more money than Russia, mm -hmm. and, um, and that we, you made many great points about how we should support our NATO allies and our friends. <coughs> Where does the money come from? Because our, I mean, defense thing is being slashed. We, I mean, where do you take it from? Well, that's an uh, excellent point. And, and here at the Heritage Foundation, we have for years and years and years been banging the drum for not cutting defense. I mean, this is one of the biggest problems that we are facing with the Obama administration. Um, because in the, under the current scenario, we are guarding our defense in, a, in an absolutely dramatic way. And, and that just, you know, where does the money come from? Well, it should be there. It ought to be there. Uh, it, this is a government that has, you know, that can find money for, you know, trillions of dollars of other spending, right. but it, not, it, not in our strategic right. interest. This is a government that can spend 20 or 30 billion every year making electricity more expensive with alternative energy projects. Uh, yes. There are lists and lists of services and goods the United States government does not have to provide. This is a government that has 47 million people on food stamps and states competing to get m more food stamp money, where we could just dissolve, devolve the program to the states, say, here's the money, you take care of it, and mm -hmm. you can keep the rest. It's a government that sucks in gas tax money from all over the country, then gives it back to states and say, you build this highway, this bridge, that bridge, and by the way, you have to have a project labor agreement that makes the labor cost two or three times the much that they would be otherwise. And by the way, you have to spend 15% on mass transit, even if you're in Nebraska and you don't need any mass transit. <laughs> we have so much money that we could be using, uh, but we are really, really inefficient. But the beauty of increasing natural gas exports is that it does not cost the federal government one dime. All we're doing is it's, we're saying you can sell more abroad. In fact, it creates money. It creates money because there's more production, so there's more tax revenues. Uh, more people are employed, that's more tax revenues again. Increased economic activity generates tax revenues that can be used for things such as building up na national defense if the president doesn't want to use it on some absurd battery power project. Yes, and not, not to forget the takeover of one-sixth of the U.S. economy in the shape of the, you know, healthcare. Okay. Right, exactly, yeah. We like to keep this to one hour for those of you who need to go back to work. So we're going to end it here, but we will have. There was a question from the gentleman up here. Oh, of the do Russian you want to do it? Oh, this is okay. one of our lawyers. <laughs> oh, he's one of them. And, <laughs> uh, would you identify yourself? <laughs> Thank you. Certainly. My name is Paul Larkin. I work here at Heritage. Okay. I, I have a question about the delay. You said mm -hmm. in 2011 applications were submitted to the Department of Energy and yeah. they're still sitting there. Yeah. I mean, is the. I wonder if you could just. Talk about that. Is it because of political opposition from environmentalists? Is it because of resource constraints, because there just aren't enough people at the energy department to process them? Or are there legal restrictions that they have to satisfy and for whatever reason is taking terribly long to do it? Uh, so I, I think that if the perhaps the owners of the companies, uh, such as um, Carib Energy, Gulf Coast LNG, perhaps if they'd made better ca uh, campaign contributions, the applications would have moved a little faster. But from what I can see is these company, the Energy Department is just sitting on these applications. It would help us uh, if we had a rule, for example, that applications have to be processed within three months. That should give the Energy Department enough time. But uh, for, and I, I'm not quite sure of the reason. I do have a list here of the companies uh, with the dates. It shouldn't take that long. I think it's political uh, and environmental opposition. Just the way that the pipeline, Keystone XL, is not getting approved because of environmental opposition. There is no reason, no rational reason, for these permits to take so long to be approved. I mean, they can either say yes or they can say no. Just like with Keystone XL, they could say yes or they can say no. If they were to say no, Canada would be building a railroad down and the oil would be shipped by rail. Uh, to the top of the U.S. border where it would be transferred to a pipeline. But just because they're sitting on it, that means no rail company is going to build the railroad in case then the administration says yes to Keystone XL, then the railroad wouldn't be used anymore. Thank you. 
question. What an excellent discussion. Thank you both so much, ladies. We have some gifts. We want to give you a little something here to thank you. Um, so we have some thank you gifts. So. Yeah. I think that both of you already have our very special limited edition coffee mugs. <laughs> oh, so these are for so your much. husbands. <laughs> oh, they don't have saying, one that's purple. What is the famous I like saying? It. What is that saying? Yes, it is. No good deed kind of... goes unpunished. No <laughs> good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> and of course, <laughs> True. to carry your mug and other books and things, uh, our oh, latest book bag. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Thank you. And, and from Heritage, um, we love to give books, because we're a think tank, um, a, a copy of the classic, conservative classic Frank Myers. In Defense of Freedom and other related essays. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Uh, the discussion will continue with lunch outside uh, the auditorium. So I hope you can stick around and continue and ask uh, the questions of our speakers. We want to thank you both for joining us today for this really important topic. We'll continue to follow this um, in the months ahead. So thanks so much. Thank you.